So I've had three different conversations recently with three different people in three completely different s- stages of life in the course of about three weeks. And it really got my attention because in each of those conversations, they, th- there was this struggle that came out. And um, they didn't say these words exactly, but what I heard from them was really each of them wrestling with this question. And the question is this, how do I find direction for my life? How do I find direction for my life? So I was standing at the cafe talking to a dad of young children, and he was there trying to share a little bit of his heart while these young kids were saying, Dad, can I have money to buy something? And he was like, here, you know, he's pouring out his heart to me while he's <laughs> giving them money to go buy something at the cafe. And really, he was saying, my, you know, I love my family. Uh, my job is going well. It's providing well for my family. But he's, he said, I just feel like there's something more. I feel like my gifts and abilities aren't being utilized. And I wonder when it's time to know when there's a change. Another time I was standing in, in Main Street at between services talking to a guy, I would guess he's in his 70s, and he told me that he just retired from trucking. And his aging eyesight actually forced him to change, make a change that he wasn't looking for. And so I was asking him, how's it going with that? And he said, well, I've missed it. He said, trucking was my purpose, and I'm really struggling. I'm not sure what my purpose is now. Third conversation, I was sitting at a table across from a high school senior getting ready to graduate and asking, how's it going? And they said, well, it's hard for me to know. There's so many different options. I'm not sure. And I don't really want to make a decision because I don't want to make the wrong decision. And I could relate to that because I remember when I was in high school graduating from high school, and I wasn't really sure what my next step was. And I just want to ask if you're here, whatever stage season you're in, how many of you would say, big or small, how many of you would say you need some kind of direction for your life right now, looking for some kind of direction? Yeah, many hands go up. The thing about when we have a lack of direction, it can be frustrating. It can feel discouraging. It can being stuck in indecision can make you feel kind of frozen in life. And maybe you've tried this prayer, Lord, show me your will. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Yeah, I have, like probably hundreds of times. <laughs> Say, Lord, show me your will. Show me your will. Direct my, direct my steps. Show me your will. And I prayed that, and then I would wait. And I'm not really sure what I'm waiting for. Maybe God would like put some kind of message up in the sky that I would see. So I'm waiting for him to show me his will for my life. But that's a great prayer to pray. And if you're praying, Lord, show me your will. It's fantastic. Keep praying that prayer. But I also think in addition to that, Scripture actually gives us a pathway to walk for direction. And that's where we're going to go today. We're going to look at a parable that Jesus gave You, if you grew up in church, you may know it as the parable of the talent, the parable of the three servants. I'm going to call it the parable of the three bags. Now, we've been on this journey over the last few weeks to look at how Jesus answered the question from his disciples, what are the signs of the end? If you weren't here the last couple of weeks, that's what we've been digging into, Matthew 24 and 25, those two chapters Disciples asked this question, what are the signs of the end and what will signal your return? And so Jesus gave some signs. He said, look, there's going to be some chaos. There's going to be some conflict. People's hearts are going to grow cold. Many people will be deceived. They'll walk away from their faith. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So keep one eye on the future of Jesus returning, whether we take our last breath or he returns, and keep one eye on the ground. Don't be unprepared. Be unyielding. Endure. Be faithful obedient. That's what we've been looking at. And then Jesus brings this parable, the parable of the three bags. And on the surface, it seems like it really doesn't have anything to do with the signs of the end. And it made me ask this question. I wonder why did Jesus put this parable in his answer about the end that really doesn't seem like it has to do with the end? And I've, from my opinion, my perspective, I wonder if it's because When our focus is on the end, it's very tempting to live in fear. If our only, even our primary focus is on the end and Jesus returning, it's very tempting to miss the opportunities right in front of us. And so we're going to look at this parable, Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to give you three simple questions that I believe will help you find direction for your life in big, small, whatever you may be facing. So Matthew 25, verse 14, 
These are Jesus' words, again, in this discourse that he gives in answering the question, what are the signs? Here's what Jesus says. Again, so it's kind of like this is an additional answer to your question. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. Everybody say long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, everybody say long time. (laughs) Their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Now, I'm going to just pause there for a moment. When you're reading a parable of Jesus, really any teaching of Jesus, but especially a parable, we don't want to make it say more than it was intended to say, but it is important to, to, to interpret and to discover what are all the different characters in, in a parable. And so in this parable, I would say it's pretty obvious that the owner, the master, the owner represents God and the servants represent followers of Jesus. And so the owner, what's the, what, what's the responsibility of the owner? The owner owns it all. Right, that's what an owner does. The owner owns it all. The servants didn't own anything. I think that's important to understand. They were given something and they were given this bag. That's why I like calling it the parable of the three bags. They each were given a, a, a bag or a couple bags. And these bags were freely given. I want you to think about a bag being a blessing and gift, B A G. Blessing and gifts. You know, so much about Christianity has turned into to do's, right? Action. What am I going to do with this? <clears throat> and I have to actually be careful even as, a, as I'm putting sermons together because my mind goes right away. Okay, what do we need to do? We read this truth. How are we going to apply it to our lives? And I'm not saying that's all bad, but I can easily drift into just Christianity is about what we're going to do. But you know, this parable makes it clear that God has given, freely given you something and it must be freely received. There wasn't anything we did to earn it. It wasn't anything we did to deserve it. It was just given freely. And these bags are highly valuable. This translation, they call it a bag of silver. Well, what was a bag of silver? You dig into that a little bit. It actually, you can calculate the the value of these bags because in the original translation, they called it a talent. That's why this parable has been called the parable of the talents. Talent was a measurement of weight. Didn't that word was not used for abilities that we had. It was used as a measurement of weight. So uh, you can go ahead and put this slide up. Here is how we can determine the, or calculate a bag of silver by weight. So one bag of silver was a talent. Well, that doesn't really help us. We don't know how much a talent weighed. And somewhere I read, I think they're about 75 pounds, but we really don't know what value does that bring. But one talent was worth about 6,000 denarii. That sounds like a lot, right? Except we don't know what a denarii is. Denarii is plural for denarius. So one denarius was the equivalent of payment for one day's labor. Now we're getting to how we can figure out what this value was in here. So if it was the equivalent of payment for one day's labor, that means a bag of silver would cover 6,000 days of work. One bag. Or if you work seven days a week, that would cover about 1,200 weeks or about 23 years. So these bags are highly valuable. And the owner just handed it to the servant, really didn't give any much instruction about it, just entrusted the bag to them. What was his to them? Because there was a relationship built on trust, but they had to figure out what to do with this money. And there's one important fact that I don't want us to miss. Each of them would would give an account for how they had used 
what they were given. They would be accountable for how they would use what they were given. Now, let's keep reading. Verse 20. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, which really isn't a small amount, right? Five bags. Each bag was worth 6,000 days of work. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. (laughs) How would you like to be called that? You wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Which is not talking about hell. It's just talking about regret. So you have these two servants, right? Good and faithful servant, wicked and lazy servant. A good and faithful servant is who we would want to aspire to be. Wicked and lazy servant is probably someone we shouldn't aspire to be. Good and faithful servant, they were rewarded. What was their reward for doing well, handling those responsibilities well? They weren't given more vacation time. They weren't given early retirement. They were given more responsibilities. And they said, let's celebrate that. The wicked and lazy servant, they hid it because they actually mischaracterized or misjudged the owner. Said, oh, if you're a harsh man, you're probably, you know, I don't want to mess up, so I'm just going to hide it here. I'm afraid. I'm going to keep it, put it in the ground. And it actually caused them to lose it. And what was the result? Regret. So I love this parable, but if I had to sum this whole parable up in one sentence, because I think it's important to pull out, okay, what, how would you... How would you just clarify this or simplify this, this parable? Because there's a lot in here. Here's, what I, here's how I would put it into one sentence. And I think it aligns with what Jesus teaches us all throughout his teaching. But using what you have to help others multiplies it. That's the big idea that I see in this parable. When we use what we have to help other people, that's what multiplies it. Now, I'm going to go take on a little journey today because I want to give you three questions. These are very simple questions that I think you can use in your life that will help you find direction for your life. Whatever stage of life you're in, whatever you're facing, I would encourage you to start with these questions. So I'm also going to encourage you to write these down so you have them. So I have a little assignment for you as well. All right. Question number one. Here's where we start. The question is, what do you have? You're looking for direction in your life. Here is a great place to start. A- ask yourself this question. Okay, what do I have? And based on my observation, I came up with seven categories, what I'll call seven categories of uniqueness. And there may be more than this, but these are the ones that I came up with that when you look at what you have, this is what makes you unique. 
So I want to go down through these. And again, I'm going to encourage you to write these down as a reference point. What do you have? Number one, you have time. Time is the only limited resource. We've all been given a certain amount of time. We don't know how much time we have here on the earth. And I think that's one of the things that makes life so sacred and precious because it's limited. We don't know how long we have here on the earth. And so we're not going to be judged for how much time we saved, how efficient we were, but we will be held accountable for what we did with the time given to us. And so learning how to manage our, our time according to the priorities in scripture is a way to manage it well. Or as the psalmist says, and I think it's Psalm 90 in this little prayer, Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may grow in wisdom. Teach us to number our days, count, make the days count time. Number two, what else do you have? Do you have money? Money is a fantastic tool, but a terrible servant, a terrible master. Sorry. It's a great tool to have, but it is a terrible master. We've all been given a certain amount of, of money. We won't be judged for how much money we make or how much money we earn, but we will be held accountable for what we did with the money given to us. Next, we have skills. You know, education is given. The reason there is education is to develop useful skills. What comes easy to you that may be hard for other people? What skills, abilities do you have? Again, the bags were given according to the abilities of these servants. So what skills, what useful skills do you have? Next one is knowledge. How do we gain knowledge? Primarily by study and past experience. Study is how we acquire knowledge. And we gain it. Past experience, though, is a fantastic teacher. You know, when you're young, and you're in school, and you're, there's a lot to learn. So you're just, when people are young, you gain a lot of education, you learn a lot in life. But as you get older, it transitions from knowledge to wisdom. So you take that knowledge and you say, okay, how does this apply to my life? It's like that saying, did you ever hear the saying that you know, knowledge tells you that tom a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom tells you that a tomato should not go in fruit salad. It's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. So how do we gain knowledge? I'll just give you a couple examples of how I gain knowledge. One of the primary ways that I gain knowledge is my Bible and journal time every day. And this has nothing to do with me being a pastor or working at a church. It just is a primary place for me to gain knowledge. Every day I take my Bible and I get my journal out and I create a space where I just say, God, what are you speaking to me through your word? And I would argue that having a daily Bible reading habit is a foundational spiritual discipline that every other spiritual discipline should be built on. Because if you take a break from reading the Bible and just say, you know what, I'm just going to spend time in prayer. I'm not going to really read my Bible right now. I just want to spend time in prayer. That's a good habit. But be careful because you can easily drift away from the truth of God's word. If you say, I'm just going to talk to people about Jesus. I just want to share Jesus with people. I'm not going to read my Bible right now. You can very easily drift away from the truth of God's word. So I'd encourage you to build that practice in your life as a primary way to gain knowledge. You know, another way I gain knowledge, I like to connect with people who are smarter than me, smarter than I am. And there are a lot of people in that category. But I love to connect with people who are a little bit further down the road from me and just asking questions and listen, learn from people. You know, who I like to spend time with people who have been through some stuff in life and they're on the other side with their faith intact and they're standing strong. Those are the kind of people I want to learn from. I want to learn from people who have been in leadership for a long time. And they're standing on the other side with optimistic perspective. I want to learn. How do you do that? I want to learn from people who've been married many, many years, raising adult children, because that's the stage we're in. I want to learn how to be a dad of adult children. 
I want to find people that I can learn from. Another way I gain knowledge is from past experiences. This one is really hard for me because uh, sometimes when I reflect back on the past, I think about those times where I've dropped the ball or I have some regrets of I would have handled things differently. And what it does, it kind of stirs up some emotion in me. And I'm not really interested in processing that. So I kind of like to just ignore that and just kind of focus on the future, right? Let's just keep focusing on the future. But you know, past experiences can be a really good teacher. Now, if you're like me and you think back to the past and it's like, just kind of get stuck in regret, it's very tempting to just be like, uh, I wish I would have handled that differently. I should have done this different. I should have done that different. But you know, a different way to look at past experiences is just simply this. If I knew then what I know now, I would have handled it differently. So now I'm going to take that knowledge and apply it to my life now and into the future. Past experience is a great teacher. Knowledge. Uh, next one is family. We are all connected to a family, whether you like your family or not. You've been born into that family. And let me just say, my observation is you will be connected to your family in some way for the rest of your life. It's the way God designed it. You were born into that family and now there's a connection there. So I like to remind myself, don't make it difficult for my family to love me or like me. That's a great filter to look through. And if you're in the stage of thinking about choosing a spouse for marriage, that is, in my opinion, next to choosing to follow Jesus, choosing who you're going to marry is the most important decision you will make because it has lifelong implications. Choose carefully, learn and choose wisely. Next one is friendships. God gives us this gift of friendship. And you know, friends, he uses friends to shape us and he uses us to shape our friends. But friendships can be so rewarding. They can also be messy, but they are worth it because it's this gift that will sharpen one another. What do we do with the friendships that we have? And then finally, the last one is just simply current options. What are the current options, the realistic options that are in your life right now? That's all part of this bag. What are the current options? You know, for me, um, I'm 46. And if I have this dream and I just think that, you know, I really want to play in the NBA professional basketball, that's not really a current option for me. You didn't have to laugh that hard at that. But what are the current options? Now, the reason I think it's important to go through all that and have that as a list is because that's what makes you unique. If you put a list of all of those things that are unique to you, that's how you begin to see, oh, this is what God has given me. It's what you have. So here's my assignment to you. Later today, sometime this week, set a timer for 10 minutes, pull out a pen and paper, and just be go through each of those and say, okay, how... What do I have with time? What do I have in money? What do I have in skills, abilities, family, friendships, all of those? What are the current options? And you make this long list. You'll begin to see how God, what God has given you. And it takes you to the, this next step. So the first step is to understand what do you have? Question number two, I'm getting really deep. Who is nearby? Now, I've observed some people who want to find their purpose in life. They start with the question, what's my purpose? I need to know my purpose. What is my purpose? But you know what a better question to ask is not what should I do, but start with who do I see? Who is nearby? Because when you start to see people, you'll start to see needs to meet problems to solve, people to encourage. You'll begin to see people the way Jesus saw people. And you know, Jesus saw people. I love this passage in Matthew 9, 35. Matthew documents this. And I think it's just something must have happened that made Matthew write this down. But this is how Matthew observed Jesus. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. I wonder what Jesus did in that moment. How did 
Matthew know that Jesus was moved with compassion? What did his body language say? What were the words that came out of his mouth? Something, Matthew saw something that Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the crowds. He could have been judgmental. He could have been harsh. Instead, he was moved with compassion. Why? Because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then there's this interaction that he had with his disciples. He said to them, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. So instead of just saying, okay, what do I have now? What am I going to do with what I'm going to have? The better question is to ask, okay, who do I see? Who is nearby? You know, nearby and neighbor come from the same root word. Who is your literal neighbor? Who is your online neighbor? Who do you see that's near in your life? Who, who is, uh, maybe it's your customers or clients. Maybe it's your coworkers. Maybe it's your church community. When you see people, you begin to see needs to meet, how you can add value to their life. So ask that question, what do you have? Then who do you see? Who is nearby? And that brings us to the third question. And again, we're going even deeper. Question number three is, how can you use what you have to help those who are nearby? And this is what I think we should call our work. Oh, our work may include our job, but it's not limited to our jobs. Jesus called it work. He said, going into the fields, there, there needs to be more workers to go into the fields. And when we understand that we've been given this bag of uniqueness according to our abilities, just like this parable says, then we need to begin to see, okay, there are people around us. How can my life, how, what can I do with what I have? How can it help? How can it add value to the people in my life? How can I encourage those who may be discouraged that are in my life? You know, at the beginning of this year, in 2023, I made a commitment uh, to encourage at least one person every day. Well, I missed a few days and I'm kind of embarrassed to at acknowledge that because encouraging others is not so intuitive to me. And I live with someone. I mean, Kelly is so encouraging. She just breathes it, but she's so good at it, at it and she has a system in her life. She's very intentional about her encouragement. And it's like, I, I want to learn. I want to be better at that. I made that decision to do that this, this year because that's one thing I have that I can help someone else. What is it for you? What may God be prompting you to do with what you have, the people around you, how you can use what you have to help others? Now, again, why would Jesus throw this in the middle of, of his answer about the end you know, these signs are these signals of the end. And I would just go back to again, I think it's because if our focus is on the end, whether it's the, our last breath on the earth or when Jesus returns, if that is our primary focus, it would be very tempting to either live in fear or to miss the opportunities in front of us. And so I just want to bring it down. What could God be speaking to you through this message? You know, you hear this from me regularly, but this is just my opinion. But I look at life, I see that there are three seasons. I know some people think there are four seasons, but in life, I think there are three seasons. What I would divide them, they're unequal. But there's a, the first 18 years of a person's life, that's a season. The middle ages, that's a very long season. If God gives you a long life. And then you have the final third. And I'm going to give you whatever season you can determine which one you're in. But I want to give you what my encouragement to you would be if you're in either any of these seasons. The first 18, if you're in the season of the first 18 years of your life, here's my encouragement to you. Ask for input from someone who is further down the path from you, from where you are. It takes humility to do that. 
It's not intuitive because as teenagers, I remember what it was like. You think, oh, I know everything. My parents don't know anything. No one older than me knows anything. But you know, as you get older, you realize, oh, I didn't really know anything. And I don't know as much now as I thought I would. As you're in that stage and you're wondering about direction specifically, ask those who are further down the path. Ask them questions and listen. There's gold. If you're in the middle ages, whatever stage you're in, in the middle ages, here's my encouragement to you. Rediscover what God has given you. Rediscover it because life so often those day after day and days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, months turn into years. And all of a sudden you find yourself in this place and it's like, God, why don't, I don't even know. Is there more for me to do in this season of life? Rediscover what God has put in you. If you're in the third season of life, what I would call the final third, and here's my encouragement to you. And you might be thinking, well, how can you say that? You're only in your forties. How can you speak to, uh, you know, this final third of life? I would just submit to you. Here's what I would encourage you. Keep sharing your optimism with the next generation coming. There's a lot of pessimism and negativity in the world. But if you've been through some stuff and you've seen God be faithful and your faith is intact, you're still standing even th after all that you've been through, share that optimism with the next generation. We need it. You have a wealth of gold. I think that's it for today. <laughs> Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And right now we just make a moment for your Holy Spirit to speak. God, would you have your way in our lives? Have your way in our homes. Have your way in our workplaces. Have your way in this church. Have your way in our bank account. Have your way in the time that we have here on the earth. Have your way in our friendships, our relationships. It's the simple prayer, have your way. With your heads bowed, I want to give an opportunity. If you're here today, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, or maybe you did when you were a kid, but you drifted away. I want to give you an opportunity to make that decision today. You know, the invitation Jesus gave was he'd just say simply follow me. He would say, follow me to the one whose life was a mess. He invited the religious leaders to follow him. He invited men and women, young and old, those whose lives were broken and those whose lives who appeared like everything was great. And this invitation to follow Jesus still stands today. Every person has this invitation and you either receive it, answer it or reject it. And my encouragement to you is that you would take this step to humble yourself in the presence of a holy God, repent of your sins. That just simply means to turn from your selfish ways, turn from living for yourself and choose Jesus to be your Lord and savior. If you'd like to make that decision today, I want to lead you in a prayer. And it's a prayer that sets you on a new course for your life. If you're ready to do that, I'm going to ask you to repeat this out loud after me. I'm just going to invite everyone to do it just so nobody's praying alone. Would you just simply say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he rose from the dead. For me. 
Today I repent of my sins, receive forgiveness for my sins, I choose Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And I want to use what I have to help other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We can all look up. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or if you know that was a decision you needed to make today, I want to ask you to do something that takes a lot of courage in a room like this. The ushers have a gift for you, and that box is a Bible, some other material. Would you just put your hands straight up in the air, unashamed of this decision, till an usher sees you and they'll hand you that Bible and that gift that's for you? We had a few people respond in our 9 a.m. service, so I'm just telling you that because you're not alone. You know, you may look around this room and think, oh, everyone has it together. And the truth is, we're all at different stages in our uh, spiritual journey of following Jesus. That's why I love the local church, because we gather together, we can encourage one another in our faith, even more as the day of Jesus' return, our last breath here on the earth gets closer. And so if you'd like to make that decision or if you have a few questions about it, I want to encourage you to stop by Connections after the service. If you have one of those uh, Bibles, take it there. We'd love to meet you and walk with you and walk alongside you because this journey of faith is not meant to be walked alone.